right, now we move on to uh, the second half of our program today. And um, the topic for this session is putting assessments online. And we have uh, Michelle, Adam, and uh, Louisa, and Empia for these, uh, on these three different topics under the same category. So shall we begin with uh, Michelle? Michelle, can you share your screen with us? Okay. Okay, hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, just want to share with you our experience converting one of our face-to-face -face presentation to video record a video recorded presentation. Um, so just to give, we, give you a bit of a background about the task, the course is uh, English for Mathematics and Statistics students. They are supposed to read a case study report and present a summary of this report to their peers. So this is a task that they would normally do um, across, well, in the, in the curriculum. So this is one of the tasks that the faculty asked us to uh, set as an assessment and help the students with their presentation skills. Um, audience would be teachers and peers from science related disciplines and students would present in groups of four, three to four with each student presenting for about four to five minutes. The students are assessed individually. So when we all switched to online learning, we kept all the elements of the assessment except that instead of doing it face-to-face, -face, we converted it into a narrated PowerPoint presentation. We decided to do a narr narrated PowerPoint presentation because we thought it was the closest uh, task and that, fulfill that fulfills the same uh, task validity, basically. So uh, the students will still have to read the report, pick out key information, and present that information to uh, their audience. It also required minimal technical equipment a lot of the students don't have cameras, but at least they can. Ha they have a microphone and a PowerPoint to be able to do this. And there's a. We found a lot of ready-made uh, technical tutorials available, so we help the students prepare for this task by sending these tutorials uh, to them. So especially like little technical bits, like even just sometimes pressing record and if the video and the audio disappears and how to synchronize that. Um, so when we um, set the task and watch students' presentations. Here are ob ob considerations and observations. So because obviously the face to, um, there's no video component. So we had to alter our delivery and visuals criteria. So we did not assess students for body language, facial expression and gestures, which we would normally do in a face-to-face. -face. And we also extended the criteria in voice and visual design because well, it's just all about well, narration. So we did, we also altered our materials to focus on these two skills. Uh, a lot of uh, one two hour lesson on voice training and another two hour lesson on visual design. Where normally students would also use natural speech when they do face, a face to face presentation, maybe use a cue card and there's an audience interaction. We noticed that students, every single student scripted their presentation. And this obviously has an impact on their natural speech. So less, uh, there were no, almost no language errors if there were, um, because it's scripted obviously. And almost all of them also read their scripts aloud with unnatural intonation. So uh, just to show you, this is our original criteria. When it was a face-to-face, -face, all these eight points. The descriptions on the, in the orange box are those that we deleted when we switched to narrated PowerPoint and, that, and what we extended and kept is, are the um, items in the green box. Just give you a couple of seconds to read that. Okay, so our insights running this type of assessment this semester. Uh, we're going to work on emphasizing the difference between spoken and written language, especially because students prefer to script their presentations. We'll probably get them to work on reading aloud skills if they're going to do this, making them knowing how to do it more naturally using uh, stress and intonation. And what really worked was using student exemplars for demonstration, demonstration purposes. A lot of the videos we showed students are from YouTube, which are obviously sort of quite professionally done 
and we want to show students some more that were obviously done using just the minimal equipment that they had. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Very well timed, Michelle. <laughs> All right, uh, now we have Adam. Um, well, let me start my timer. Um, thank you, thank you everyone. Um, so I'm going to be talking about moving a face-to-face -face discussion assessment to an online one. Um, oops, let me. So a bit of background. Uh, this is a, a course for higher diploma students. Uh, high, higher diploma students, if you've not taught them before, um, there's two issues with them. One, their English level is pretty low, so DSC may be level three or lower, but also they're lacking confidence. Um, they've been labeled as underachievers in English, so they, they lack confidence. It's a 39 hour free credit course and it focuses on writing and speaking skills. The key learning outcome is that they need to use verbal and non-verbal skills in, a, in spoken communication in a group context. And we want to try to con achieve that in, even in the online assessment. So the existing assessment before we had to go online, it's a group discussion, it's conducted face-to-face -face in the final week of the um, semester. There are three or four students per group. It's a 15 to 20 minute discussion. We give the students topics beforehand and they can research it and then bring some research into the assessment. Um, so that was the original one before we had to go online. I'm gonna tell you what we did because the time is short. Um, so what we ended up doing was a one-to-one -one discussion with the teacher. It's still conducted in the final week, but conducted online. So you had one teacher, one student per group. So not multiple students, just one student. Um, instead of a 15, 20 minute, we had a five minute discussion and we still provided the topics beforehand and students could research it and then bring it into the assessment. So that's how we updated the assessment. Um, some of the challenges that we were facing, like practical challenge, challenges, students at the start of the semester, they were not turning on their cameras. They were not even turning on their microphones. These were low level students. They didn't have any confidence in English. They didn't want to um, share their spoken English with other other students in the class. They just lack confident, uh, confidence in English. Um, a lot of that is due to also to their living environment. They're living in very small environments with their family members. It's a noisy environment. Like I have a noisy environment now outside of my office. Um, there was pedagogical um, challenges. So there's a lot of differences between an online discussion and a face-to-face -face discussion. So like in an online discussion, it's more the um, different moves in a discussion. It's all my turn and your turn. While in a face-to-face -face discussion, uh, there's a lot more interaction. And we have to think about the teachers. Do they have a chance to provide sufficient input and feedback for a, a group discussion? And we have technical challenges at PolyU. We use Blackboard Collaborate and that has limitations. And we also, if we were gonna have four students online at the same time and the teacher, we knew there'd be synchronous assessment issues. So one student maybe would not be able to get online or they would lose connection and that would affect the assessment. Uh, security, we, like now we have Zoom at PolyU, but there was opposition from students to using Zoom. And we had some real security, security concerns, at least in the middle of the semester and we wanted to fulfill these learning outcomes for the subject so that was also what we wanted to do so i won't i'll skip this you can see the powerpoint later going forward uh did it work yes it did work um, um it was it we did it two weeks ago and it it was fairly successful the teacher feedback was generally was generally they said it worked fine the main problem that it made teachers very tired because they're doing five minute assessment and a short break and another assessment and another assessment and it was pretty tiring in doing 20 students in like three to four hours um student we're getting some student feedback um i'm still collecting the student feedback that's quite mixed some stu some, some students prefer the teacher assessment some students prefer a student a group of students assessment and um, we're also collecting data so we're going to compare the grades from one year ago when we did a face-to-face -face discussion with this semester when we did the online uh, teacher plus student discussion um, the main problem, like as uh, Michelle like, just uh, talked about, is about the rubric. So we did change the rubric slightly, but because we need to go for a lot of procedures to change rubrics Ten significantly, yep. um, we have to change these rubrics if we're going to keep the online assessment, especially for particip participation grade, because that doesn't fit with an online assessment. So that's what we'll have to change in the future. Um, 
Okay, that's it. Right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Blanche. Okay. All right. Uh, now we have uh, Louisa and Andy. Can you? Yes. From Hong Kong, you. Hi, everyone. Um, okay. Can you see the yes, slide? Yes. yes. Um, so, in this session, uh, Anthea and I would like to share our experience of um, administering a writing test um, via Zoom. Uh, so, first of all, let me explain why we'd like to have a proctored test rather than a take-home assignment. Uh, in fact, it's a test for architecture students. Uh, in the test, they have to write one persuasive email and one persuasive letter based on some given information about urban development issues in Hong Kong. And they are being tested on their skills of persuasion. Um, we didn't want the students to be able to discuss the tasks with each other, um, so that's why we'd like to have a proctor test rather than uh, a take-home assignment. And these are the steps of preparation. So first of all, we uh, explain to students the rationale for having a proctor test. And also then we explain the mechanism uh, with images. So in fact, this is the information that we put on the course Moodle with images. So uh, we told the students that they have to be in a quiet place and they have to connect their mobile phone uh, to Zoom and place the mobile phone on the side so that the camera can capture both the computer screen and a side view of the student, as shown in figure one here. And they will need a stand or a tripod for their mobile phone, as in figure two. And they have to make sure the computer or their, and also their phone are connected to a power source, uh, as in figure three. And they have to disable the auto lock function on their fo phone so that their phone won't go into the sleep mode, as shown in figure four. Uh, they, of course, they were told to make sure they uh, would have stable Wi-Fi connection activity. Um, so, um, well, after that, uh, two weeks before the time to set up the equipment and test out the equipment in class to make sure everybody got the equipment for the test. And the last point here is very important. Uh, we showed our understanding. So we uh, explicitly uh, told the students that we understand that some of them may be living in a, in a very small place or they don't have a, their own room. So uh, if they do have any concerns or difficulty, they should come and tell us and we would have offer help. So so in fact, among uh, the 100 students there, only one student in the end did uh, come uh, and tell us that uh, he didn't really have a suitable place for the test. And uh, we advised him to go to the learning commons. And a few students did their test in the uh, architecture studio as well. So in fact, in the end, everybody uh, managed to complete the test. So on the day of the assessment, um, the question paper was released on the course Moodle. And be before the test began, we had to remind the students to go to washroom or get water uh, before the test began. And uh, at the end of the two hours, at the end of the test, uh, students uploaded their test to turn it in. Uh, I'm now handing over to Anthea now. Okay, I'm going to share some points from our reflection. So overall, we find that the process was quite smooth. Uh, for five classes of 20 students each. And we're glad that the students were willing to cooperate and they were generally well behaved. And um, there was actually a bit of resistance at the beginning when we first announced that it's going to be an online proctor test. So some students said that uh, it's not easy for them to set up the environment like what it is shown in the photograph. Uh, so we asked them to test out uh, especially when we have a rehearsal. Uh, so in the end, uh, they all figure out how to do it their own way. So we conclude that uh, the arrangement is feasible for assessment on skills rather than Google knowledge. And um, when the students go through enough practice in class and they feel that they are prepared for the assessment and, and also they feel that we are prepared, the instructors are prepared and we think that they're less likely to cheat. So next slide, please. Okay, so th these are some factors for you to consider if you have to consider whether to conduct such a uh, online proctor test or not. So first of all, is the nature of the assessment, which you will know best. Uh, and secondly, there should be enough time for preparation. In our case, we had the rehearsal and that really helped. Uh, lastly, is the availability of makeup tests in case some students are not able to satisfy the technical requirements. So you can warn the students that if they don't set up properly, they will have to seek for a makeup test that would be quite scary for them. Uh, 
So I hope these tips are useful to you. That's the end of our presentation. Thank you. Well, so well done. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now we have five minutes uh, um, to discuss any questions that uh, some of you may have. Uh, I guess we have uh, uh, one or two questions from our chat box. Uh, perhaps, uh, well, Michelle, yeah. let's see. Um, I've already responded. Okay. Oh, just a question. Just a minor question. Uh, did, did you actually um, explain to the students the adapted marking criteria before they had the assessment? Yes. Yes, um, of course. Yes. And did they have any questions on, on, on the marking criteria? I mean, was that a, a product that, that, that came about after your discussion with students or because this was the first time they had something like this? Mm. Right? Yeah. No, no problem. Okay. No, yeah. Okay. Any other questions for uh, our speakers? I, I'm interested in the proctored exam. Um, mm. I, 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 it's been an issue like for, for us. Like we're, we're, we're concerned about is the student who's actually doing the writing online the, the students who's in our class. So this is one way around this. Um, something we can investigate. I want uh, City U, UST, are you considering doing proctored exams in the same way as Hong Kong, um, Louisa and Anthea? Um, 2,000 students on Monday in a writing exam, <laughs> proctored written exam. 2,000? Yes. How? how? <laughs> um, all of our instructors were involved. Um, maximum size groups were 40. Um, uh -huh. So we had uh, our own students, um, so we could identify our students. Mm -hmm. um, it was slightly nerve-wracking to start with, but um, it, it worked. I've got other colleagues online here that I, I know were involved too. I, 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 they might like to add their con col um, comments. Yes. And at CityU, we recently had, um, not sure about the number, it's probably approaching 2,000. Um, what we did was we set up a very strict time limit uh, to submit to turn it in um, so students could download the assessment pack upload by the deadline and yeah, there were hiccups um, and concerns about you know not being able to upload on time especially if they were living in the mainland and mostly though considering the numbers it was it went pretty smoothly thank you yeah, I should probably add some details like Stephen. Um, we used Canvas assignments uh, and, and then uh, on, and, and Zoom, and then the assignments were submitted through Turnitin. What is the percentage weighting of this test that they are going to take? Um, well, I talk. Yeah. It, uh, 10, only 10%. Mm -hmm. okay. um, ours were up to 40% depending on the course. So, um, well, quite high stakes then. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think it helps at UST that, that a proctored approach was what's being taken across the university as well, so it's not odd for our students. And it's the same idea of having a camera that's, that's they're asked to fix a camera. If we were doing it in isolation, it'd probably be different. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's one little thing that we can share with you. We thought we were, we were worried that students uh, would be using online dictionaries, okay, because you might not be able to see very clearly on the screen what they're doing on the computer. But interestingly, they turned out to be so honest because we told them that they could use all the functions on Word because they were asked to type their, um, their, their writing on Word. So they could use the thesaurus on Word. Uh, they could use the spell check, grammar check. But it turned out that they, yeah, I, I, we can tell from their writing that many of them did use the thesaurus, but they picked the wrong words. So <laughs> in the end, the writing, uh, you know, the vocab, the choice of vocabulary was not mm. very appropriate. Uh, we, can, we can tell that they didn't really use any um, online dictionaries. They didn't check on online dictionaries. So I think um, in, at the beginning, we, we thought it might be um, a bit, um, uh, students might be reluctant to use this. It might be uh, difficult, but uh, it turned out that it, it, um, it was actually easier and uh, smoother than we expected. Um, I think the rehearsal was very important because in the, re uh, in the rehearsal in the class, uh, we could see, we could try and see what we, uh, we could 
you know um, the, the the what the setting is like and some some of the students um, may not really have the quite uh, right setting uh, we told the students maybe you should hang your your camera the, the mobile phone on the wall <laughs> okay so that would be it would get closer to your computer screen so uh, we, we did check um, uh, in the rehearsal so um, then you know from the view of the um, invigilator uh, what what we can see from the view of, of the invigilator I think that that's um, that helps a lot. Yeah. Um, I raised a question in the chat mm -hmm. and then um, ah. in CTU um, uh, we, we have piloted using Zoom to mm -hmm. uh, monitor the exam for a mm -hmm. very very small group of students and in general we simply like what Stephen has said we ask the student to lock on campus and then they have um, they have to complete the writing task within the time limit and upload it then it will check by um, turn it in. Um, I wonder um, what the other colleagues in other institutions um, experience are. Uh, do you use any any programs like Zoom or Lockdown Browser or uh, respondents uh, to, to monitor the exam? And um, what, what are your students' response to these kind of measures? Uh, do they, I, I do they tell you a lot of um, uh, concern about privacy? I can answer it briefly for Polly U. Yeah, we, we followed what uh, Stephen and City U were doing. We would make we had a um, using turn it in and gave students a limited amount of time to do be to to do the writing and then submit it. Uh, we didn't use Zoom, but that's something it seems it worked quite well. We might investigate it for ne if we have to c carry on online next year. It's something we can investigate. Um, sorry, I want to. We're we're going to yeah. run out of time. Yeah, we run out of time. Yeah. So. so yeah, so perhaps we move on to the uh, the last yeah. session, uh, um, on understanding student engagement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have John McKay. Are you? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. 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 Okay. Uh, wait, wait, wait. I've forgotten how to share screen. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit embarrassing to admit, isn't it? Uh, okay. Let's try and do that. Uh, okay. Can you see that? Yes. 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 Okay. Terrific. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, John, I'm at City U. Um, say say hello to a, a few old old faces. Tom, Nick, Kira, Michelle. Long time no see for some of you. Not 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 so old. Okay. Um, uh, so this is a this is a very short survey, brief survey I did with some of my students um, uh, for using Zoom. I mean, uh, basically what I what I told the students was that this was an informal survey for myself just to kind of improve my teaching and I would share it with other people. Um, but because uh, most people, uh, myself and the students were, were new to Zoom and Zoom was obviously not designed for teaching. Uh, it was designed more for meetings and um, plus we didn't know how long it was going to continue. I mean here at City U we're certainly going to be doing this uh, in the summer. So I thought it was good to get some uh, that, that kind of feedback. Okay, um, okay so st uh, students. Um, I, I used it with uh, six different classes, three business classes, three uh, engineering classes. So uh, in total, that was kind of 138 students, but it's hard to say how many of those 138 students actually contributed because I kind of put them in groups and asked them to, to work together. And sometimes students submitted a, a, a survey, a questionnaire individually, and sometimes it was a group. So somewhere between 36 completed questionnaires and 138 students, that's the kind of the total number of students that were actually involved. Okay, uh, this was my questionnaire, just a very simple, basic one. Uh, what do you like about Zoom? What do you dislike? Uh, is there anything that other teachers are doing in other classes that we're not doing in this class that you would like to do? Uh, what would you like to have done more of? What would you like to have done less of? How would you rate uh, uh, Zoom? Okay, those were the questions. So the, the response, um, what do they like? Okay, obviously they liked, they liked lots of the functions. Um, comprehensive functions, they could watch recorded videos, etc., etc. They like the fact they could use it on their mobile, they like the fact that it could record and screen sharing and stuff like that. Some of them liked the, uh, it, it, they said it, it seems to make them uh, um, respond more, uh, more interactive, though to be honest, I think that was quite a minority. Um, yes, yeah, some of them said it helps with interaction and they like the breakout rooms. Uh, what else? Do they like? Of course, also they liked the fact that it was uh, convenient, you know saving, saving travel time, not moving around campus, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, yeah, and anyone could, could host meetings, this, this kind of thing, okay? What do you dislike? There were lots of things they disliked. Um, uh, uh, internet connections was a, was a big problem. Some of them said they got disconnected. I, I also, I remember in the chat box, you know, getting, getting students saying, oh, I've, I've, I've come out to the breakout room. Can you put me back in there, please? Uh, you know, and they hadn't done it deliberately. So there were, there were internet connection problems. There were also problems with videos. Um, some of them were saying um, it's difficult to see a video because the, the, the kind of the, the um, uh, yeah, the frame, it wasn't the right size or kind of buffering, lagging, or problems with the uh, audio video. Uh, also, <laughs> comment here, lovely comment, can cause a ruckus if everyone has their video mic on. Uh, yeah, I wish I'd been teaching uh, ruckus in uh, vocabulary classes and things. Great word. Um, but yes, that's, that's what they kind of noticed. They also noticed security issues, these kind of things, and cannot share screen at the same time. They were saying that's a problem. What also would you dislike about it? They, they disliked, um, they had problems with the interaction that they were saying they found it hard to concentrate um, and group work. They were complaining that it's difficult to, to work with, uh, uh, with a group, with, with group mates that you don't know, that you've never actually met these, these kind of things. Um, okay. Sorry. Lots of too, too much information here. Um, what do you dislike about zoom? They're, they're also interaction in the class and things like that. Some of them were saying distant feeling in class participation hinders the interaction okay so there were various reasons why they 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 felt that it was it was problematic it wasn't working very well minimal teacher student interaction this kind of thing okay too much time waiting for responses in the chat box so they had lots of problems okay um any any things that um you uh, other classes used that we weren't using so they like the poll function i didn't use the poll function very much students seem to like it uh, again, writing on the screen. I didn't. I, I did that a bit, but not very often. They said, "Okay, it's good. Let's do more of it." Kahoot, Kahoot. I I didn't use, but those are the things that they they said they liked. And um, what would you like to have done more of? One more of, and less of. It's always a ten more seconds. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, group mates can talk more. There were some dysfunctional groups. Okay. Um, more individual responses. Okay. Let me just jump to how would you rate it overall? Ninety-nine percent of them said that overall it was good. They liked it. Um, User-friendly, interactive, but lots of problems. Hard to concentrate online for, for the whole semester. Security issues. Easy to cheat in exams. The students were saying that. Okay. So overall, okay, they had problems. They they issues with group work, security, and assessments. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, going over time. Thank you. All right. Now we move on to our last presentation. Okay. From Brian. Uh, hello. Yes. Just a moment. Okay. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, I guess, address the issue that I think a lot of uh, people had this semester was get, having students complete activities and actually have engagement in the course. And I think that was mentioned in several of the previous uh, presentations as well. Um, I had the joy of being an online student because um, I just started my doctorate degree um, and an online teacher at the same time uh, this semester. So I kind of just want to contrast my experience between the two and maybe highlight some of the differences that marked maybe very high engagement in the class that I was a student and low engagement in the class that I'm the teacher and maybe some things uh, to consider to increase that. Um, so this, I just put this up here because I think this kind of summarized maybe a lot of our experiences um, with uh, trying to conduct online Zoom lessons, uh, you know, doing breakout groups and, and, you know, people really not engaging or participating in lessons and communicating. Um, and this is what I would see, uh, see when I, I think of my online class is this. Um, so <laughs> this is my grade um, in my online class. Um, that's not my final grade. I know my boss is watching. I can see him on the screen. It's not my final grade. It's, this is in the midst of the class. Um, so the, the idea here is that this is tracking the progress on all of the activities and work that I do in the online platform. So if I post an update that everyone can see, some paper, some comment, a reply to a comment, a presentation, a peer review, and all of the, uh, the movements that I make in the system and the, my activity and my engagement 
is tracked and then it's visualized for me. So I can actually see as I'm progressing through the course how much I have left, if I'm lacking or, or lagging on something or falling behind. And um, when I talk to a lot of the students who are taking online courses like this, this is one of the, the key factors um, that they like for keeping them engaged and motivated to complete activities and keep up on the work. Um, so as, as you progress through the semester, you can see it move and you can see some sort of completion. Um, so for, our, for us, uh, these are just some examples you can look at. Um, we have a lot of this data already if you're using learning uh, management systems like Blackboard, Moodle, uh, Canvas. Um, this is the Blackboard. We have student overview for a single course. You can look at it. You can see how many hours students are in the, the course, what they're doing, how many hours they're uh, spending on activities, what are they completing, what are they not. Um, I was also using Microsoft Teams this semester, and so there's analytics in this, so they were doing chat and uh, where they have to do like discussion board activities, write a post, reply, and so I can see class um, engagement and then individual student engagement for posts and replies. Um, and then I can see individual student reports like this, so I can see digital activity and communication. So digital activities, if they're ac accessing files and actually, you know, looking at the content, looking at videos that I post, and then I can also see their communication. So are they actually participating and actively engaging? So I have this data already, but the, it, the problem is, is that uh, I think there's two problems. One, we need to have a way to visualize that for students so, so they can see what I see about their activity because I don't think it's enough for me to email them and say, I see you're not accessing this file. Uh, you're not doing this and that because it's gonna take too much time. I, I'm not interested in doing that, but ways that we can automate it and visualize it for students and then maybe assess it could be um, considerations. Um, in Blackboard, you've got goal performance dashboard, so you can set up activities to be linked to different categories and as students complete things and, and receive grades, um, it can give them little bars. I know in Moodle, I've used this one before with completion tracking and progress bars. So with completion tracking, you can have your list of um, different tasks and then um, it tracks it for students and they can see their a visual progress through like a progress bar um, as well. Um, and this you can also set up where you, you know they complete a sequence of activities and it can unlock other activities as well. So there's a lot of ways that you can use this to also design modules and learning modules for e-learning. Um, Canvas, just another thing you can do is this is one in Canvas called Badger where you can set criteria for um, um, these badges that are assigned so students can see some sort of progression um, in, in as they complete. So I think this is an issue that with with moving from the face-to-face the -to, -face to the online, it's really difficult for them to see right, no seconds. their movement. Yeah, um, and one thing that I'm really interested in is uh, this social e-reader called Perusal. So for example, you take uh, like a reading and to increase the reading compliance, which in some cases you can see is like 20%, um, this company claims you can get it over to 90% and I've seen some research that supports it. So you put in a, uh, like a, a text, students can chat on it, ask questions, respond kind of like a chat, um, board as well and it's kind of like group annotations. So this could be something that's maybe a, a, a equip, Better than trying to do it in zoom um, Like analyzing texts and you also get the analytics as well. So you can see how much time students are right. reading, uh, What comments how many of that and this can be like tracked and incorporated into that. Okay oh. <laughs> Thank you. All right now we have uh, five minutes for discussion uh, we've got some questions in the chat box, but I guess some of them have been answered by the speakers. Are there any other questions that people would like to raise for our speakers? Hello, John. I've got a question um, about uh, the limitations uh, of a good yeah. work. It seems that uh, it can be overcome to an extent. Uh, they can use WhatsApp, uh, Messenger, or even phone calls to talk to each other. It seems yeah, that uh, good work is still not a big problem for my students. Use other ways to, to solve the problems. Sure. Yeah, I know a lot of my students were doing that. I mean, so, sometimes you 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 know you put the students in a breakout room and you go into the breakout room and say hi, how's it going? And there's silence, and you realize they're not there. They've actually they're actually you know they're they're on WhatsApp or they're or they're somewhere else. So yes, I know that. Yeah, they they were they were they were finding other ways. They were finding other ways. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Hi, John. I would like to know about the security issue of using Zoom. What exactly it is? This, this, I, I don't know all the details. Some of the students were saying they were concerned about personal information. Okay, that was, that was one thing. So I, I don't know how much information they have to give when they log in or they're worried about people 
what is it? Zoom, zoom bombing or zoom whatever. Bombing. I don't know. Um, but it, that was, that was a genuine comment from one of my students, you know, we, we can cheat in exams. I mean, this was, this was also what we had in one of our, uh, one of the business classes, the students were supposed to do a, uh, a meeting. Oh, sorry. That was one of the comments that I, that I ended up skipping, which was, um, Obviously, lots of assignments were not designed to be done on Zoom. And uh, if you didn't spend a lot of time redesigning the assignment, then uh, you ended up kind of doing a, a bit of a mishmash or a half and half assignment that wasn't really designed for online things. So I had, I had so for example, for one of the times we had a business uh, meeting, the students were given a, um, an assignment. This is your topic. You know, your company has been found to be involved in some nefarious activities, what are you going to do about it? But what we did is we, we ended up publishing it, you know, sending the, the question to the students in advance. And so obviously the students, you know, had X amount of time, 24 hours, 48 hours to prepare things. So, um, uh, you know, and, and so some of them still did it very well and very naturally. Others, you know, came up with a scripted uh, scripted meeting which was which was which was not good but uh, so yeah we still don't there's there's lots of issues with assignments that were designed to be done in the classroom and haven't been changed enough for when we give them to the students because that was sorry that was also one of the other comments i had was that what is it uh yeah you know it's difficult for us to do good online group assignments you know with students that we don't know very well or for assignments that are designed for the classroom and haven't been altered very much. So I'm, I'm, I, I really, it's a problem. I don't have the answers. I'm just kind of reporting the feedback. Okay, uh, we have less than two minutes. If anyone would like to, uh, if anyone have questions to ask. Uh, someone asked me if I've tried to use analytics available this semester to encourage better student participation. Um, yeah, so I mean, I would, I tried towards the beginning of the semester to like, you know, I mentioned to students that I can see what you're doing, I can see what you're not doing. But again, I, because there's no really accountability um, for it, um, I do think it's limited. So I think, you know, there's two, two issues. And then also, it's, it's a little bit of a burden on the teacher to try to you know, chase down every single student and 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 uh, do that. That's why I think it'd be better if it's somehow built in. And this could be even in a blended learning um, environment as well, because I think there's always an issue with students, you know, if you're doing like the flipped approach or blended learning approach, completing the pre-task um, uh, activities. Um, so I, I think it's like, I think it's sort of important that students can kind of see, see it as well, rather than me just reporting on it um, as well. So I think that visualization is really important. Okay. So I guess we have already uh, finished all our discussion sessions and our presentations. Uh, we, we got one more. one more. Yes. Last, yeah. The last part is on collaboration and mm -hmm. we have one more uh, presentation and then we'll move on to reflection and looking forward. Mm -hmm. So now let's have uh, Aditi and I know that Aditi's uh, group, uh, most of uh, the collaborators are also here. So I give the time, the five minutes to uh, teachers late. Hi everyone, this is Aditi. Uh, can I share my screen now? Yeah, sure. Okay. So I hope you can see this. So we call our podcast Teachers Lift, and many of you have probably already heard about it. Um, we call it the Teachers Lift because it's the kind of conversation that you're likely to have with a colleague in a lift about teaching and learning. And um, it is the result of uh, what we like to call COVID creativity. During these times, we have been forced to try out new things in teaching and learning. And um, this is a platform for us to share those good practices and talk about them by inviting colleagues from HKUSD, from CityU, from Hong Kong U. Basically, this is an inter institutional podcast, which is teacher initiated and teacher led. Um, you can see that this is our logo. 
and Patrick, who came up with this idea, Patrick Deloche, who came up with this idea, he has promised us uh, free mugs for all of us with our names on it. So we are look, we're still looking forward to that. Uh, what have we done so far? So uh, we started in March uh, 2020, and for two months we've been uh, going very smoothly. We have released 15 episodes uh, on student engagement, building communities of practice, uh, produ produ production of uh, pre-recorded lectures, experiential learning, online assessment, um, and um, yeah, many things, um, basically mostly on language teaching, but they could also expand into other areas of teaching. And um, I hope you have gone through the website, which I'll show you very soon, and subscribe to it. So at the moment, we have um, three partners, as I've already said. Um, the HKUST team is led by Sean McMinn. Um, Hong Kong U team is led by Pat Deloge and uh, Adam, of course, leads the team in um, HK in Poly U. So, what do we aim to do? Um, we hope that this can build and sustain um, a community of practice and enable the sharing of best practices by inviting not only experts in this field but also teachers like you and me. Um, who who want to share something new that we have done with others and probably get feedback on it as well um, and um, at some point we hope that we will be able to create some kind of meaningful podcast production opportunities in hong kong u for students as well as part of multimodal digital literacy um, of course we haven't um, done it yet but we hope that it will happen in the future and um, i'd li now like to show you um, this is what it looks like. This is our website. We are on Apple Podcast. We are on SoundCloud. And this is our, yeah. So the latest one was um, episode 15, Making Sense of the New Normal, talking about, um, you know, what is a lecture? Do we really need a lecture? And I thought that was really insightful. Uh, you can see the other topics here with colleagues from all three institutions. It's, yeah. Um, Please let us know if you have any questions. Do subscribe. Um, and um, yeah, that's all. That's all that I have to share today. And I hope you'll enjoy these podcasts. Thank you. This Great. is our, yeah, this is our link. Great. Thank you, Aditi. Welcome. Yeah. Great. OK. Um, we will now. Uh, Okay, we will now move on to, let me just unshare Aditi's, uh, can you just unsh stop sharing? Uh, okay, right, thank you Aditi. Yes, okay, right, now we will move on to the last part and then we will have overall discussion, including um, we could also ask questions about the uh, po podcast, uh, Teachers Lived. So here's the time we have invited uh, the head and directors from the eight uh, ELC. Now we have seven uh, head and directors or representatives here. So, and uh, we've given them two questions to answer. So the, we will um, have them uh, tell us each got a minute uh, about the first question. So what is the biggest challenge your center has faced it in the last six months? So after that, uh, we'll move on to the second one and then we will have overall discussion. So um, just feel free um, to, to, to talk. Or should we just move from the, from, in this order, maybe Miranda first. Hi everyone, uh, lovely to see so many current and previous colleagues. Um, okay, so many challenges, very difficult to choose one, um, but um, something that really resonated with me um, actually in the last um, version of the Teacher's Lift with Susan Bridges, which is a colleague of ours at Hong Kong U, she was talking about uh, the fact that what, we're, what we've been doing is not really online teaching, but what we've been doing uh, this semester is what she calls emergency remote teaching. And, you know, when I was think thinking about that, um, I think that that's true. And we 
as a centre have felt a little bit uncomfortable with the fact that we're being forced to make changes so quickly that what we can't really do is think um, a little bit more strategically about what good online practices are. So I think if we were to switch to online teaching and to plan this out, we would have done things differently to the way we had to do them for very practical reasons this semester. So although uh, I think the emergency remote teaching has been very successful, um, it's not really utilising the full potential of online teaching. So um, online teaching has become synonymous with Zoom. And I think that that's what students think as well. But really the whole gamut of online teaching, there are so many different resources. And what we haven't really had time to do is to explore a lot of asynchronous possibilities. And I think that that's something that we, we need to think about in the future. And we've also been limited uh, by our learning management systems as well in terms of what we can do and what we've had to do very quickly to what we probably uh, would have done if we had more time to prepare for this. Um, okay, sorry. We're okay. Under, we have to... <laughs> Next one. <laughs> Is uh, waking up because I'm talking, but go on. Okay, thank you, Miranda. Um, Cece? Yeah, uh, hi everyone. Uh, nice to see you all and thanks for, for the uh, wonderful sharing. Uh, very, very valuable and, uh, and useful to us. Uh, in terms of challenges, and actually when I received the questions and I asked a few um, teachers and I did a quick survey, and it seems that a uh, um, shared feeling um, about these challenges, and first of all, is a technolo uh, technological. And uh, I definitely agree with Miranda. It's, it's, it, it, it is a really, really, uh, teachers had very little time to prepare for this uh, synchronous online real-time teaching. I think most of us probably had never taught a whole course at such a lens, at such a scale. Uh, it's almost completely online and not to mention assessment. And uh, it's not a, probably a totally uncharted area, but uh, it's certainly not a preferred way for Hong Kong teachers to teach. And so it is underexplored and we're not prepared. And, and the second one, which, I mean, the first one, second one, they're not uh, sort of uh, in terms of a degree of importance, rather it's in terms of, uh, of emergency, which is more urgent than the other um, at a different stage. So the second one is pedagogical. The soon after the first one is, you know, is dealt with, not overcome. The first challenge was dealt with. And the second uh, challenge immediately emerged as the pedagogical. As Miranda just said, we, we, we hardly, you know, we, we never, you know, all the materials are actually prepared for face-to-face -face teaching. They're not for online teaching. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, and how to adjust and adapt to these confines and constraints of uh, online platforms available in such a short time. And you know when most of the materials are actually designed for face-to-face -face teaching. That's um, the the two major you know challenges that. Uh, that okay. Thank yeah. you very much, Bruce. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thank you. That's some in very interesting sessions. Um, there's so much to talk about. So many different challenges. I decided to focus in on people, and again within that there are challenges on worrying about people's health and safety. Technical issues seem to be less of an issue than we thought they would. There were two things I wanted to focus on. Number one was information. Uh, one of the problems I certainly faced was keeping people informed, but at the same time being very aware that as soon as you start to give people information, they get overloaded, they get flooded with information. You then start getting feedback that, you know, please stop. So information was one. The second one was while recognizing the stress and the workload of our colleagues, at the same time trying to ensure gently that the students were getting a, a learning experience that as far as possible met their expectations. And there's my timer. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> loud that sorry <laughs> right uh diane please yes hi i guess i i feel like some of our students when they're not the first to be called upon all the good answers have already been given um i i 
think that a, a lot of the challenges that we have faced are, are ones that have been discussed at length today. So assessment, making sure that it's robust, making sure that it's secure, um, that, that it is as good as it has been in the past at differentiating the extent to which students have fulfilled the learning objectives, even though we've had to do it in an entirely different way. Um, student participation, student satisfaction have been things, have been real challenges to deal with. I have been concerned, I share Bruce's concern for the sort of information overload on staff. And I, I think adding to that is the fact that we're not getting the release that we, we usually get from the routine when we meet in the office and, and can exchange a joke or, um, or a smile or commiseration. So on the one hand, there have been a lot of problems to solve. On the other hand, we're, we've been a little bit detached from our, our workplace social support network for it. Um, I entirely agree with Miranda that we have a long way to go before we can say that we've fully exploited the affordances of the, the distant teaching model. I have, in addition to those familiar concerns, a concern about our students' experience in the sense that we hope that by placing them in the English medium environment, they'll be interacting with English in a rich set of ways listening to lectures, having classroom discussions with their friends, reading, writing, doing social interaction on campus. I am concerned that by being off campus, the English medium environment has been much, much less for our students. And I, I wonder if we're going to, to see an impact of that mm. in the future. Mm. So those, I think, are some of the challenges we faced. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Um, Belinda, please. Yes, thanks. So I won't repeat all the answers given. Um, so looking at my choices, the one I would add to that is the challenge of trying to mediate between university-wide policies that are coming down, which are welcome because it's useful. But then what we do is often not quite how the rest of the university does things. And so the challenge of trying to adapt, I mean, we don't want to go against what the institution's saying, but then adapting that for what, what fits our context. Um, and then also the communication back because the university recognizes that we do a lot of teaching. So their discussions with them, uh, with senior management, to try to make sure that their decisions also fit what we do, um, for me has been one of the challenges. Um, probably wouldn't have been my first, but you don't want to hear me repeat what others have said. Okay, thank you, Melinda. Um, Simon, please. Um, Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, sorry, I'm driving at the moment. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to add, uh, yeah, I think uh, everybody so far has mentioned much of the same challenges we've faced. The one I'd pick out on, and I think other people may agree, is uh, the increase in workload that we found with delivering this uh, emergency remote teaching. And uh, particularly in carrying out those day-to-day -day administrative tasks, those small five-minute meetings that you have face-to-face -face with colleagues during the course of a normal working day, seeing the, uh, the amount of emails increase and seeing a short task that you could be done face-to-face -face in a few minutes, stretching out over hours, days, when they shouldn't be. Um, looking ahead, I think, uh, yeah, as other people have mentioned, we've got to be preparing. And I think Miranda made the best point there that, uh, yeah, it's not really the best of online teaching that we've been offering. And I think we should be preparing contingency and having different versions of our courses which properly exploit the strength of online teaching in the future. And also to contain contingencies for those students who perhaps don't have the facility, the equipment, the internet connection, or even the privacy to take part effectively in online classes and to try and include tasks and activities that these students can still actively participate in, even if they can't join uh, the online class with a proper video camera and so on. So I think these are the things that we'll be looking at in the future. Hmm. Okay, thank you, uh, Simon and, and Blanche. Oh, okay. 
uh, I guess uh, the biggest challenge in my center uh, has been, you know, the difficulty of uh, engaging our students. Uh, we have got three language teams, Chinese, Putonghua, and English within our center. And uh, it, it has been quite challenging in terms of engaging students because a lot of students, um, um, well, quite a lot of them uh, have been under the impression that, well, perhaps uh, it, uh, uh, it's just a matter of fulfilling, you know, course assignments and uh, course requirements and then, you know, just to get a grade. And I guess um, uh, there should be a lot more pedagogical meaning, right, behind uh, the things that we design. And in terms of uh, what we think that our center should focus on in the coming months is um, now we, st we are still not sure about, you know, the development all right, of, uh, of, of, of COVID-19 and, you know, the teaching arrangements, class arrangements, you know, even density control, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess um, as, as, as a center, uh, we need to see, you know, how we can further exploit the pedagogical potential of uh, online teaching or, you know, blended learning uh, in the coming months. Yeah. Okay. Right, thank you. In fact, some of you um, have already touched upon on the second question, so maybe I'll open it up to all the heads and directors uh, to say uh, anything you would like to add in on the second question. So what do you think your centre needs to focus on in the coming academic years and how could the centres collaborate? Uh, maybe I can just say something. I mean, I think um, what we're doing today is is what we need to do. Um, so we need to get as much experience out there as possible and share as much, much experience because we don't want to all recreate the wheel. Um, but we all recognise that our uh, institutions are different, um, our students are different, the curricula is different. So, um, but what I would suggest that we need to do, each centre really needs to do, is to have a conversation together and have a very clear vision of what we believe, what, what we value in terms of pedagogy. So who are we, pedagogically speaking, as a community? Are we communicative teachers? Are we task-based teachers? Are we process writing teachers? And what we decide um, in relation to the pedagogy should match whatever we decide to do in terms of online teaching. But you can't make those decisions, I think, at a, at a centre level until you have that conversation where you get a very common understanding of what we as a centre and I imagine what each other centre values pedagogically. Um, and then it's just a matter of, um, um, yeah, sharing experience, trialling um, and just building up capacity and building up knowledge and building up experience as we go. But it's it's... It's a long process. Mm. I come in here a couple of things, I think. I'd like to pick up on what Miranda was talking about. Um, we're beginning a process of actually looking back over the past semester and trying to work out what it is that we can learn from it in terms of what Miranda was suggesting in looking at our pedagogy um, two years down the road. So not just sort of sighing a big sigh of relief and thank God that's over. But what, what can we learn from it? What was positive? What can we bring out of it? And then re-examine our pedagogy and our curriculum and see how we move forward. So I think within our centre, that's probably our main focus. But again, to uh, pick up on something Miranda was saying about collaboration, I think we should recognise the great work that's been done by the hub. It's brought together practitioners, it's brought together teachers extremely successfully. I think what we're missing in this is bringing together more people like Miranda, Melinda, myself, the directors of the centre as well, because I think in addition to having a common understanding amongst the teachers, we also need a common understanding in terms of policy, a common understanding in terms of how we can support each other strategically. Um, and that conversation, I think, at least needs to include, if not perhaps be started by uh, the centre directors. And I think that's perhaps something that we should be looking forward to be doing more of. I mean, I meet with Miranda, Melinda and others, but we don't really do anything systematic um, and that's something I would quite like to see in the future. 
I was going to say something similar because it strikes me as a as a newcomer to Hong Kong that this past Kong, year, we did, past a, year we, did a, we did a lot of trying to of, of having to respond to immediate emergency challenges. But I was struck by how in this place that is, you know, it's geographically doable and we do similar things that if we had more rich networks, we wouldn't have to be reinventing so much. Um, and if we could do a little bit more, um, if, if there's a bit more there, that perhaps we could support each other a bit more and 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 save some of the energy of trying to figure out how to respond. Um, so I, I completely agree with that. And I think this teacher's lift is a fantastic example. And I think that as center has the, the least we can do is to start to recognize this kind of activity and give people time and space to do that sort of activity. And at the same time ourselves join forces and, and think a bit more about how taking a joined up approach might put us in a position where we're not having to work so hard for some things. Um, it's, it's, it's much easier for me when I have discussions with senior management to say, yeah, well, HKU is doing this. Um, so don't, you know, a little bit of rivalry helps, right? Um, so if, if we had these sorts of networks, we, we could kind of work in a concerted fashion that way. Yeah, I uh, definitely agree with um, all the speakers before me. Uh, I think that you know, um, e-learning perhaps is is inevitable, really. And uh, no matter if we are not short of reasons, uh, social unrest, uh, coronavirus, and so on. So, uh, and the sharing like today is extremely useful and valuable. And I have learned a lot, and you know, from uh, you know, all the. Uh, and speakers and all the teaching tips, all the tools are very, very useful. And uh, so some of, the tools, some of the tools are new to us. So it was really fascinating to know how they use it and uh, what kind of function they have. Um, and also, uh, I think that, you know, at our center, I think it's a very important as, um, you know, Miranda and, and Bruce had also said, we, uh, we need to revisit uh, the practices we had. We learn from our experience, uh, you know, uh, and Blanche talked about engagement and to us, and I mentioned the pedagogical, but the under pedagogical engagement is indeed the biggest challenge because most of the students don't turn on their computer, sorry, um, camera and a mic, and you don't know whom you're talking to. So, so, so the, the, there is a strong sense of lack of control. So I you know how to sort of resolve that challenge. And then like today, you know, we, we established a list of uh, and best practices, not only across institutions, but even within the center. Sometimes, you know, we haven't established that kind of a culture to share with each other, you know, the teaching tips and, you know, so on and so forth. And, you know, it will be very conducive and, and to, um, to learning, to students learning and, and, and you know, our, our professional teaching. And all these strategies, you know, can help us to maximize, uh, and, you know, students' engagement and ensure learning. And one of my colleagues, and he put it very nicely, in this, uh, Sarah, put it in a, in, a, in a very nice way. It is, ultimately, it is a question of meeting students' basic psychological needs of autonomy and connectedness and also um, competency. Um, but but we, we do have a problem because uh, most of the teachers, they have a very heavy teaching load. And I don't know about other uh, I think it probably is similar with, you know, across all the universities. And so often, I mean, we, you know, this hub uh, uh, sharing is wonderful, but very often teachers, you know, this kind of sharing cannot reach every teacher because of the heavy teaching load. And so, um, you know, if there is a repository somewhere and we can, uh, you know, you know, uh, sort of access those uh, resources that would be wonderful. And so the teachers can also watch the videos and, and, and you know, at their convenient time. And if resources can be um, put together across and within, the, within our center and also across the centers, and that is wonderful, you know, and the materials uh, that can be shared among all the teachers as well as the students. I think that some of the self-access materials are wonderful, uh, like I, I COSA, which recently I heard uh, I, they're going to shut down in Ningna, which is a great pity. I, I think it's a wonderful material and uh, because we don't forget that our students need help too. And uh, so at the initial stage when we started to use the Zoom and the students had no idea um, about this technology, they felt panicky. Maybe it's easy, you know, easy to learn, but then they didn't know. So students need help as well. And the students actually have different learning 
um, preference, you know, in style and pace. So they, they need to support as well. So uh, we, we hope that uh, we can do more uh, in the future um, in that aspect. Okay, thank you. Any more sharing um, from the directors and head before we open up to everybody? Okay. All right, good. Um, let me just jump in to say that just now Cece mentioned about the, um, all the resources. In fact, yes, we have on the Hub website um, uh, resources and you can see all the past, actually all the past sessions, recording and PowerPoint uh, all under here. So, um, so you can see all the, uh, um, yeah, from all last three years. So please come and visit. And also we have um, interviews with colleagues and also presenters uh, from them to talk about, uh, you know, uh, their research, uh, their presentations. So a lot of resources here under this resources. So please uh, join the hub, all right, to get access to uh, the resources, participate in discussion. And actually we also have a whole page for the Teachers Lit podcast. Yeah, as Aditi said, 15 episodes. Right, okay. So now let's, thank you everybody. Um, now let's open the floor to um, all the colleagues. Um, uh, and, and while we're waiting for questions, um, uh, one of our colleagues is gonna share a survey for the end for this session. So if you could uh, just spend a couple of minutes complete, completing the survey, and then you can also ask questions. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, we'll keep this here, okay. <laughs> Um, Can you put the link on chat? Yes. Hmm. Thank you. So just a couple of quick points, if I can. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, somebody mentioned um, the students' general preference for um, uh, writing comments in in the chat room and so on, and was wondering why and it it seems to me it's it's kind of generational um there's a great book by her name is sherry turkle called reclaiming conversation and she talks a lot about how the use of the human voice like using your phone as a phone instead of as a typewriter um th there seem to be lots of reasons for people in especially the the, the young um they, they, they don't like the spontaneity of conversation often. They, they want to be able to craft their best self, and so that involves writing. Um, so I, I think that's probably a factor. Um, it seems like across the board, people aren't talking as much as they are typing. Um, so I, I, I think there's something to that. And then just on a lighter note, um, I asked some of my students in, in breakout rooms or, or individual consultations, um, why are you reluctant to, you know, do you have a camera? And they would say yes. And I said, why are you reluctant to, to switch it on? And the two answers were, we are ugly. Uh, and I said, no, you're not. Um, if I can remember from the first two weeks of lessons. Um, and and I, th I think maybe there's an element of not wanting you to see their flat. Uh, they might not know about the background uh, uh, option. And the other one, which I quite liked from um, the, my very cocky and communicative law students, um, uh, one of them said, sir, we're, we're not dressed yet. It's only noon. So just wanted to say. Hmm. Maybe I could just pick up on what Stephen's just saying. And, and some of my UST colleagues have heard me uh, share this before, but uh, I, I started at the beginning of the semester saying to my students, um, if you came to my class classroom with a bag over your head, would you expect me to ask you why you had a bag over your head? And of course they all said yes. And that just set the scene for, well, why can't you turn on your camera? Um, and I, I have to say, just didn't have a problem at all with it. The, the virtual backgrounds thing, yeah, of course, they, they, they want to set up their virtual backgrounds. But. Any 
any other thought or questions for previous presenters? Views, ideas, suggestions. I'm just trying to reflect on everything that a lot, a lot, a lot of the comments that people have had. And I keep on coming back to that point that what we've been doing is emergency teaching online. And we're just moving from a face-to-face -face into the Zoom session or whatever platform we're using. And we're trying to bring in the similar techniques and similar expectations. Um, if we plan to, or if we need to plan for a fall uh, session that's gonna be fully online, so I'll hope that it won't be, but uh, if we do, we do need to rethink things like assessments. We do need to rethink things like gu guidelines and policies and principles for for students and, and teachers. So a lot of this talk about students seem to pre pre uh, prefer texts uh, as opposed to uh, voice or might use the microphone or using the video. Well, if we come into the semester, especially with the year one students, with that written and prepared in the assessments, in the principles uh, that's made known to the students right at the beginning, right? And we're consistent with that, and it's designed into the tasks uh, that they can't get away with without having the microphone on, at least. Right? The video is a different issue because there are privacy issues, and we have to be sympathetic to that, I think. Uh, but the, the, the microphone, pedagogically, then, it will make more sense, and the students will participate in that sense but it has to make us rethink things and someone brought up the conversation about asynchronous tools and i think that's something that we need to explore further right? making more use of the asynchronous tools such as a discussion forums and the chats uh, even the discussion forum could be a video discussion forum now uh, you can make use of video in that as well but again it, it, we can't think of it as just a simple add-on as an emergency uh, fix it a band-aid it needs to be properly designed into the course in the sense that uh, the, the the rubrics make comment on well what does uh, a good participation mean in a discussion forum because if you don't do that most students will just say I agree they won't say anything else to a previous student's comment or, or even worse students will just answer the discussion prompt and not engage each other so what can you I, need can I just comment on, on that because like I, I agree with all of that and it's kind of I didn't have enough time to kind of bring up a lot of those issues yeah. but kind of linked to the learning analytics is like setting those preconditions like about length and, and amount of engagement and even text quality there's there's some tools out there um, that those are those criteria are already set at the beginning so students you know they get a visualization to see if they are fulfilling the expectations that are set um, ahead of time I've just wanted to that up yeah yeah absolutely i mean if it's embedded into the rubric uh, they and you have the guidelines there for the students at the very beginning they'll quickly learn you'll still need to facilitate these discussion form activities and say well, hey no one's you're not doing this you might, have, might want you try that right but eventually students will get it and they'll get it by the third week in the semester right um I've had fairly good excuse, uh, experience with this in my first year course that I teach, but I've had to make it very explicit. And I had to learn that it was all about in the guidelines and in the rubrics. I didn't do that last year. And when I, what I had last year was just a complete mess. I had students just answer the prompt. They didn't participate. They didn't do any of the uh, in-depth conversation at all. Right. So it's, it's, it is about rethinking course design. It's just not, let's go online. It's rethinking how we design the entire course and how the assessments are uh, rethought and how we rethink well, what we're testing as well, right? The multimodality of everything. Um, our, when we're assessing a spoken task through a video, are we really assessing the right skills? And, and that becomes a problem. I was, I was going to say something similar, that part of the challenge is that the classroom versus this online is so far away from each other for a lot of the way approaches to teaching that we have taken. Mm. And 
I hear a lot of people, uh, they're spe we're all speculating what's going to happen in the fall. Will, and sh is plan A classroom, plan B digital? And I wonder if the way forward is to pull these elements that we're finding that are useful, that are pedagogically valid. After all, we, we do live in a digitally mediated world. Students, we all communicate through different mechanisms than when we were students. And so if it's, it's, to me, it's about pulling out those things that we should now be doing, even if we went 100% back to the classroom, to, to, to push ourselves not quite so far away. If the, the closer we were to begin with, the less effort it would have been. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if the, if the way forward is to really focus on those things that we can go ahead and pull in no matter what happens. And then we're, you know, instead of being 10 steps away, we're eight steps away if we're then 100% back in. I think Melinda's point's right here. And it's a, I think it's a much, much bigger issue than we want to look at. You know, our classes are a long way whether they're online or face-to-face, -face, from the unfolding reality of our very fast-changing world. And we had an example, we have an example with one of our courses where we've been talking about changing the assessment uh, to a particular type of online assessment. And then somebody pointed out that actually in the workplace that we were talking about, there'd been a completely different practice for the past five years and where we were teaching for example face-to-face -face interviews this wasn't the norm anymore but rather the norm was for individuals to send in a video um, of themselves so i think we need to also try and make closer and more effective contact with the real world um, not just making sure that our assessments uh, rubrics uh, match with what we're doing in terms of uh, the way that we're teaching but actually I was chatting with um, Sean some time ago about the competencies that our new students need yeah instead of learning outcomes um, and I think it's absolutely right and I believe UST that's your buzz term now and I think that's absolutely right looking at what the students need to be able to do it goes back to the 1960s what do you do with language um and now it's not just what you do with language but what do you you what do you do with all those tools all those various media that you, we use to um facilitate uh, communication so it's rather a broad frightening picture but i think we need to at least scrape down the core uh, the edges of that Any more from anybody? Um, I'd just like to uh, say something. I, um, all these discussions have gotten me thinking about, you know, um, when we talk about cameras, you know, uh, whether students uh, bring up their video cameras, you know, whether we see them or not, and whether they participate. So um, what I thought was if we could reverse it, I mean, this is what I tried doing in my classes is to build this community and when I started with the class, uh, I, I stated the challenges outright. And I told the students, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be very challenging. Some of you might find uh, that your classmates won't want to turn on the cameras, you know, when you do group work uh, in your breakout rooms and so on. And, and I stated uh, outrightly the reasons why, you know, as, as you mentioned earlier, like, you know, the apartment and so on. So, and then I got them on to thinking about, okay, uh, how can we as a group, as a community of, you know, learners actually, you know, solve this and make sure that our learning's on track. So in that sense, I think they got thinking and said, oh yeah, I need to help myself and I need to help my classmates as well. So, and starting on from there, I had very few issues about, you know, cameras turn on because everyone was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, um, and, and they were in the PJs and, you know, they, they were in the bedrooms with their pillows, with their, you know, with their toys, uh, staff toys and so on, and they were very comfortable. And, and I thought that might be a, a way forward for, for some of us, yeah. Mm. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. Uh, hello. I, I'd like to make a response. Um, I think like uh, something that I learned soon from this semester is um, 
the questions of participation in our um, course assessment. I found that uh, students are more or less coerced, you know, to turn on the camera because that would affect their grade. And I also feel that I can co-course students who do not turn on the camera and they're on task. There's no correlation between turning on the camera and participation. But as teachers, we're hand-bound to give students who have turned on the camera with more participation, which doesn't make sense to me. So this is my uh, observation, this uh, term. In, I teach the, in the MA course, none of my students turn on the camera, except one. The student was from Hong Kong, but all the students are from China. But I managed to get them to turn on the camera just five minutes before we end the term. I said, let's have a picture together. But I never had any problem throughout the term that they didn't participate. They asked questions. I have evidence to prove. So I think the camera thing is an overkill to me. Thank you. Um, can I say something? Uh, hello? Sure. So I completely agree with Benjamin. I feel that the online world is a far more egalitarian world where power difference between teachers and students matter less, other than, of course, digital divide, which I'm not going to go into. So expecting them to turn on their cameras and seeing that as um, lack of their participation may not be the ideal way to encourage participation. Because again, I have noticed that the ones who are uh, showing their, their faces on camera are not necessarily the most engaged. And the ones who are not on camera are not necessarily disengaged. Because when I go to the breakout rooms, that's when I see some of them have come online. Some of them are really not, on, I mean, some of them are not on the camera, but they're really participating and, and saying things to their group mates. So maybe we need to get out of this mindset that uh, being on camera means uh, active participation. Um, that's all. Yeah. Hmm. I would just like to um, say thanks for your comment. So, we'll um, talk about Sarah, we, can't, Sarah, we Sarah. can't hear you. Yeah. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to echo what Aditi and, and Sean and Benjamin and Nora have been saying. I think that it's really important to be very flexible um, in this new environment that we're um, all experiencing, teachers as well as students. So I found that um, I had a few preconceived ideas about how I was going to approach the online uh, teaching environment. And I found that I really had to adapt quite a bit to the students. And open communication was the key for me. Um, the fact that I um, you know, had students who were logging in to class whilst they were actually moving from country to country. I had a student who was um, moving from, uh, from Hong Kong to China, but she still engaged in the class on her phone. It meant that she had poor connection, but that, um, you know, the fact that she was still uh, participating, another student hilariously who didn't respond to a student uh, who had called on her to respond to a particular question, we waited uh, for an uncomfortable amount of time, then came back on and, and said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the toilet. The fact that she still was engaging in class whilst on the toilet is a little bit, you know, hilarious, but, you know, good for her that she actually still continued, wanted to continue being involved in the class even though she was on the toilet and then one final example was where I was doing one-on-one -on -one advising with the student for an hour whose baby cousin was screaming its lungs out during that whole session um, and she was just like yeah you know uh, it's okay we'll just carry on and I was I was quite surprised at, at un trying to understand the kind of uh, challenges that she was facing while she was doing her online learning in a very very um, crowded and noisy environment um, and uh, her attitude that it was okay because uh, I suggested or well, maybe the baby needs picking up and, and having a hug and she said no no I need a hug not the baby um, so I thought that was that was really interesting and Aditi you made a, a comment about um, a kind of leveling 
when we're online. I also noticed that too. I found it much easier to create a sense of um, engagement between myself and the students. I didn't struggle to remember their names because I could see their names in their little black boxes and I could welcome students in on a much more pers personal level at the beginning of class without them you know, walking into a classroom with their backs to me, then fumbling around trying to find somewhere to sit um, whilst I manically try and remember what they're called in order to be able to say hello to them or not feel annoyed that they've been interrupted the class. Um, and so I, I actually experienced quite a lot of positives uh, being online uh, in the Zoom environment, despite the fact that I was um, rather uncomfortable at, at times just talking to little black boxes with, uh, with names on. But I also found myself sort of really thinking and learning about the students' challenges. And I think that's something that we really do need to explore, not just the pedagogical side of assessments and, and policies that, that uh, Sean was mentioning, which I also agree is, is very, very important, but also kind of really exploring the context that the students are, are working um, in and working out how we can best support them uh, in these challenging times for them as well. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yes, um, we are aware of the time. So, um, uh, is there any last one last question, comment? Lillian, can I just make one comment? Sure, yeah, sure. Hi, uh, I'm, hi, I'm Lockie from um, CAES Hong Kong U. Uh, I just want to echo on Benjamin's point, actually, because when he mentioned that uh, he asked the uh, students to you know, switch on the camera and take a class photo, I see a lot of you are smiling and you really like that idea, which is great. Um, uh, I just happen to have an alternative, and this is what I did for my class, basically, uh, because they all have to submit a certain presentation, like a five-minute presentation for the assessment. So um, I want to show them that I really appreciate their work and I really like you know, what they have done for me. So when I go through those videos, I pick the best moment at their, you know, at, during the presentation. I screen capture that and I use Photoshop. So I aligned you know, 20 students, including myself in the photo. Um, and then we, I created a really nice you know, JPEG. Um, so everybody had their best moments. Um, so not exactly you know, as efficient as Benjamin's method because everybody just had to you know, switch on their camera. Uh, but then they are guaranteed they will look great. great. And after that, you know, I show it in a, in a class and I say, you know, in the final class, I said, um, you know, this is, the, this is the little gift I, I've created for you guys. You know, they are your best moments. I love those moments. And they were presenting. Uh, they have great gestures, icon, you know, um, you know the, the eye contact and everything. And, I, and then I asked them, do you, do you, do you like this um, as a gift? Um, and then if you don't like it, I, I will not share. Or I can just blur your face out. Um, um, if you're not okay, and everybody loved it. So, and then I, I make sure everybody liked their faces before um, I send out that, that JPEG photo. So maybe something that, you know, is a little touch um, uh, that you might want to consider next time if you know, we have uh, online teaching, something like that, that we are not being able to, uh, you know, really take a class photo. And that, that's it. That's all I want to say. Thanks. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. In fact, the presenters, uh, colleagues participating. Uh, I think at the peak time, we had around uh, 107 people here. So uh, out of like 135 about uh, that uh, registrants. So really wonderful. We got people from all eight centers. So thank you so much, everybody, for your participation, for your sharing and for your time and uh, we will share the uh, we will check with the presenters to share the powerpoint uh, on the website on the hub website and also the uh, the recording here and we'll also try to pick the key point and uh, properly you know share as a blog or some other ways on the website and remember we have another session coming up on 10th of june oh, yeah. steve walsh is a great speaker uh, uh, check the hub emails and register for Steve Walsh. Highly recommended. Yes. And we have another one coming up a little bit later. I've just had an email about, which the, is going to be even better. 
Yes. Cannot be better than Steve Walsh, sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> but <it's> two, <laughs> yeah, two really more sessions. Ones. Yeah, two more sessions coming in uh, June. So check the mm. help emails and we would like to see you um, in those sessions. Yes. And um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you all. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.